Hello, I'm Michael Lauer. I'm the NIH Deputy Director for Extramural Research at the National Institutes of Health. It is my pleasure to speak with you today about institutional roles and responsibilities for promoting research integrity. I think a good way to start is by telling you a story. This is a story that some of you might remember. It goes back to January 1981, when an interesting paper appeared in the New England Journal about a link between taurine levels and risk of mitral valve prolapse and cardiomyopathy. The paper was authored by two people, John Darcy and Stephen Hamsfeld. John Darcy was a, a young researcher at the time, considered by some to be one of the biggest stars among future cardiovascular scientists. He, after this paper was published, moved to the Brigham and Women's Hospital, worked in a laboratory there. One day, he was uh, conducting a series of experiments and was observed by his colleagues to be writing the results of experiments that hadn't been done yet. There were experiments that were going to be done over the next two to three days, and yet here he was writing the results of these experiments days before they were actually happening. Essentially, he was caught fabricating data in front of multiple witnesses. He, at the time, he said he was sorry, that he was under a lot of pressure, but in fact, what this then led to was a series of investigations which revealed a long history of fabricating. He had been fabricating data from many years before, and his fabrications led to the retractions of dozens of papers and abstracts. In 1983, the uh, New England Journal retracted that paper that had been published in 1981, the uh, retraction notice says, in a recent disclosure, Harvard University announced that a research fellow in the School of Medicine, Dr. John Darcy, had fabricated data that formed the basis of several publications. This event generated a huge amount of attention. Many in the biomedical research community were shocked that somebody could make up data for such a long period of time and not get caught. Arnold Relman at that time, the editor-in-chief of the New England Journal of Medicine wrote an editorial which he entitled Lessons Learned from the Darcy Affair. That editorial, even though it was written back in 1983, still has relevance today. And, and I have to say that every so often when facing a difficult research integrity case, I sometimes reread that editorial for the insights that are in there. Some of the key points that he made First is that Dr. Darcy had some kind of inner pathology that led him to lie over and over and over again and somehow be able to craft a series of lies that were so clever and so sophisticated that nobody figured out what he was up to. He noted that the way the academic system was set up, a clever cheat is difficult to expose. One question that we should ask ourselves today and that I will get back to later on is whether or not a clever cheat is difficult to expose. Might it be easier today to expose a clever cheat than it was back in 1981? A third point is that peer review affords little protection. Peer reviewers don't see themselves as police. They see themselves as people who are asked to interpret scientific methods and, and outcomes. The academic system, Dr. Relman argued, afforded Dr. Darcy the opportunity to fabricate, and clearly that was the case because he fabricated over and over and over again and didn't get caught until many years into the process. He argued that it is important for the academic community to set standards, particularly standards around uh, supervision. What kind of supervision and oversight is necessary within um, a laboratory? Some argued that Dr. Darcy was not adequately supervised, and that may have been the reason why he was able to get away with so many fabrications over such a long period of time. And finally, Dr. Relman talked about the meaning of co-authorship. There were many high-ranking, powerful people who were co-authors on Dr. Darcy's papers. And yet, despite the fact that they put them, their names down as co-authors, clearly did not know what was underlying those papers namely not much, that, that those papers were based on fabrications. Let's now go to a more modern story. This story occurred in 2006, and I illustrate it by one paper, also here in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was uh, authored initially by, uh, primarily by Anil Potty, 
who was at Duke University. Dr. Potty published a series of papers about ways to use genomics and molecular signatures to identify prognosis and identify likely responses to patients with a, a variety of cancers. This was a big deal, and in fact, by some, was considered to be a major scientific breakthrough, generated an enormous amount of attention and acclaim for Dr. Potty and his colleagues. Over the next few years, questions began to come up about Dr. Potty's work. There were two mathematicians, statisticians at MD Anderson Cancer Center at the University of Texas who were interested in learning more about what Dr. Potty had done. They were able to gain access to some data that was the basis of Dr. Potty's work. When they went through the data carefully, they were unable to replicate Dr. Potty's findings. And in fact, what they thought they found were a series of mistakes, sloppy errors they called them, which may have been responsible for the uh, apparent results. Once those mistakes were accounted for, they did not find any genomic or molecular signatures to predict chemotherapy response. They published this paper, a paper in uh, Annals of Applied Statistics in which they used the term forensic bioinformatics. The idea was to use bioinformatics and data mining techniques to uh, identify potential problems with how a scientific study was done. There was a lot of argument back and forth. There were letters and counter letters. Dr. Potty and his colleagues defended their work. They admitted to there being some clerical errors, but nonetheless, they said their fundamental findings were sound. Then, sometime later, it was discovered that Dr. Potty had falsified a credential on an NIH biosketch. He had claimed that he was a Rhodes Scholar when, in fact, he actually was not. That then broke things open. This then led to a whole new look at what was going on. This was also a very extensive investigation involving Duke University, involving the National Institutes of Health. The National Academies were involved with this. And it was eventually figured out that Dr. Apati had fabricated much of his work. I told you two stories so far. I told you the story of Dr. Darcy going back to uh, 1981. I told you the story of Dr. Potty that occurred more recently. The uh, Potty story also generated shockwaves and a lot of excitement. Arguably, the Potty story was more serious. There were many patients who were enrolled in clinical trials that were based on Dr. Potty's results. And of course, given that all those results were fraudulent, the trials themselves had no proper premise. And I could go on, I could tell you more stories. Here's another story which is very recent. This deals with a laboratory at Harvard that focused on stem cells in the heart and lung. This headline says, he promised to restore damaged hearts. Harvard says his lab fabricated research. And then there's another headline about the same story. New England Journal pulls one paper, probes two others from stem cell researcher. One thing I'd like to point out about these headlines is that they do not name the uh, scientists in question, but they do name the institution or the, uh, or the entity. The first headline refers to Harvard, and the second headline refers to New England Journal. And this gets to a critical point that I would like to make, which is that our discussion about integrity in research is now moving beyond individual names and is now focusing on, on other important players, including institutions, and journals. And I'd like to spend a good part of the rest of my time uh, talking about this. Now, most recently, the most recent story, this is uh, almost literally hot off the press, involves Duke University. This is not the Anil Potty case. This was another case. Duke University had a laboratory that was doing uh, research, preclinical research on asthma. And it was discovered that much of the data coming out of that laboratory have been fabricated, and much of that fabricated data found itself into uh, NIH grants. There was a, uh, a whistleblower lawsuit that invoked the uh, False Claims Act, argued that uh, Duke was uh, requesting money from the federal government based on false information that was uh, included in NIH grant applications. This led to a settlement of $112.5 million 
this is an enormous settlement. This is by far and away the largest settlement that, that uh, we have seen uh, because of a research misconduct case. The president of Duke University, Vincent Price, said, this is a difficult moment for Duke. This case demonstrates the devastating impact of research fraud and reinforces the need for all of us to have a focused commitment on promoting research integrity and accountability. You'll notice here that I highlighted all of us. This is not something that involves just individual laboratories or individual scientists. This is something that we all have to pay attention to. The United States government has expressed his worries. This is a statement that was made by Matthew Martin, who is the United States attorney for the Middle District of North Carolina. He said, commenting on this latest Duke settlement, taxpayers expect and deserve that federal grant dollars will be used efficiently and honestly. Individuals and institutions that receive research funding from the federal government must be scrupulous in conducting research for the common good and rigorous in rooting out fraud. May this serve as a lesson that the use of false or fabricated data in grant applications or reports is completely unacceptable. Now, I think the important point uh, to see here as we look at these various stories, we've looked at the John Darcy story from the 1980s, the O'Neill Potty story from 2006, the Harvard stem cell story, which uh, occurred in more recent years, and then most recently the Duke settlement for $112 million, is that the vocabulary by which we discuss research integrity has been evolving. And I think that is nicely exemplified in an article that appeared in PLOS uh, earlier this year. Uh, this was a paper about the use of a special survey instrument to measure the climate of integrity Within a, uh, within a research uh, institution. It's an interesting paper. It shows that the climate varies according to the level of training and according to different scientific fields. But what I want to point out is what the very first sentences of the paper say. The paper begins, breaches of research integrity have shocked the academic community. Initial explanations were sought at the level of individual researchers. But over time, increased recognition emerged of the important role that research integrity climate may play in influencing researchers' misbehavior. So yes, there is a critical component of individual researcher responsibility, but the vocabulary is shifting to also look at climate and institutional and enterprise-wide factors that may affect the integrity of research. So, I've talked about how the vocabulary of research integrity has changed over the last few decades. Now what I'd like to do is shift gears and talk to you a little bit about our vocabulary, the NIH vocabulary. And perhaps one of the best places to look for the NIH vocabulary is in our NIH grants policy statement. Now, many of you may realize that whenever you accept a grant from NIH, you agree to a set of terms and conditions. One of the terms and conditions is that you will abide by what's inside the NIH grants policy statement. So I'm going to quote from the uh, NIH grants policy statement and to demonstrate a little bit about the kind of vocabulary that we use and how that may apply to research integrity. It says here, the NIH intends to uphold high ethical health and safety standards in both the conduct of the research it funds. Before NIH may make an award to a domestic organization, the authorized organizational representative must certify a series of things. Notice what I highlight here. The award goes to the domestic organization. We give awards to institutions. We do not give awards to individual scientists. And that's shown here. Uh, this is a schematic. NIH will give awards to organizations. The organizations, in turn, will employ principal investigators. NIH acts as a funding steward while, where, while the organizations act as employment stewards. And together, we act as stewards of precious federal funds. Now, what does this mean that we give grants to uh, institutions and not to individuals? Uh, some of you may want to take a look at a blog that we put out about a year ago entitled, Wait, It's Not My Grant. The point is the grant does not belong to an individual person. This is not Mike Lauer's grant. It is the institution where Mike Lauer is working. We make awards to institutions and not people. 
So now let's shift gears to how that vocabulary focusing on institutions translates into responsibilities on integrity. Later on in the grants policy statement, we say that there are responsibilities of institutions, and these responsibilities specify responsibilities that recipients have to have written policies and procedures for addressing allegations of research misconduct, to file an assurance of compliance with the HHS Office of Research Integrity, and to take all reasonable and practical steps to foster research integrity. The responsibility is on the recipient. And when we say recipient, we are referring to institutions. The institutions are the uh, recipients of our awards. I think that one of the critical questions is, what are reasonable and practical steps to foster research integrity? And I would venture to say that there are many thought leaders who are, who are attempting to uh, tackle this question. The uh, conference that I went to in May focused to a large extent on what exactly this might mean. Okay, the grants policy statement continues. The recipient, which again means uh, the institution, the, uh, the grants policy statement goes on to say that if a misconduct investigation is initiated, the recipient must take any necessary additional steps to protect the scientific integrity of the project, protect human subjects and live vertebrate animals, provide reports to the Office of Research Integrity, and ensure the proper expenditure of funds and continuation of the project during the investigation if appropriate. So again, what we're talking about here is that if there is concerns about misconduct, the institution, as the recipient of the grant, has specific responsibilities. Okay, so let's take a step back. I presented a series of stories. Uh, I talked to you about stories uh, involving individual researchers and showed how they have evolved uh, over time. I then talked about how the vocabulary in which we talk about research misconduct has been shifting from one that focuses on the misbehavior of individual researchers to one that focuses on research climate and institutions. I then talked briefly about the NIH vocabulary and focused specifically on the uh, NIH grants policy statement, pointing out uh, how the NIH grants policy statement is quite clear that, uh, in that institutions are the recipients of our, our awards, institutions have a responsibility for assuring research integrity, and that there are certain responsibilities that they have. Now what I'd like to do is shift gears again and look at how some thought leaders are talking about institutional responsibilities for assuring research integrity. And I'm going to focus on these two uh, very interesting commentaries that appeared uh, in Nature uh, recently. Uh, one is by uh, Gonzalez and Robinson uh, from Illinois, and the other is from uh, Bagley, Bouchon, and uh, Derngard uh, from Europe. The first paper is entitled Nine Pitfalls of Research Misconduct, Academic leaders must audit departments for flaws and strengths, then tailor practices to build good behavior. We'll take a look at what some of their thoughts are. And then uh, the, uh, the European paper says that, uh, argues that we should tie funding to verify good institutional practice. And if we do that, uh, robust science will shoot up the agenda. So I'm going to start with the Gonzalez and Robinson paper. Their nine pitfalls they put together uh, through a mnemonic called tragedies, T-R-A-G-E-D-I-E-S. These are the various elements that lead to research misconduct. These include temptation, rationalization. Rationalization might be, it's just one data point, what's the big deal? Ambition, group and authority pressure. If the PI insists that you have to publish a paper in a high-impact journal in order to move forward, that might lead people to be tempted or to rationalize certain kinds of misbehaviors. Entitlement. I've been working on this project for years. I deserve to get this project done, so I'll cut a few corners. Deception. Nobody will understand what I'm doing because the result that I'm getting, I'm coming up with is correct anyway. Incrementalism. This is an interesting one. There was an article that appeared about the Diedrich Staple case, I think from Europe, uh, a number of years ago. And it, it pointed out how he started out as an honest researcher. And then he started doing little things. He made some little corrections in, in his data. Over time, he kept pushing the envelope a little bit more and a little bit more to the point where he was eventually essentially fabricating whole studies. 
a person doesn't go from being a totally honest researcher to being an outright liar from one day to the next. There are increments that occur along the way. Embarrassment, people don't want to be embarrassed if their results don't look right. And then uh, perhaps my favorite part of the acronym is the last part called stupid systems. And, and if I recall correctly, uh, what they were referring to was a, a temptation, for example, to uh, take a block of data and split it up into many, many, many papers instead of presenting it as one uh, whole. Tragedies. So what should be done about these tragedies? The authors say that institutions might protest that there is little they can do. The funding and recognition system, as it is, favors poor methods. We respond that institutional leaders must take responsibility for the working environment at their organizations. They then go on to say there are two fundamental steps that are completely under local control. One is assessing empirically the integrity of research cultures. The second is research ethics education. There's been a tool that's been developed. Uh, I believe it's called Source. This is a validated survey tool by which one can assess the integrity climate within an institution. One might identify certain parts of the institution where the integrity climate may be stronger or weaker. And then one could use that data to develop interventions and to target research ethics education. So th they say here the management literature is clear that one powerful way to bring Systemic organizational change is to find bright spots. Systems are places in an organization that are working well. Study them and seek to spread their successful practices. For that, we need data on where the bright spots are and the will to act. The solutions are straightforward, if not necessarily simple. I've sometimes heard this referred to as positive deviance. You find certain areas within an organization that are doing really well. They may have a very strong climate for research integrity. And then what you do is you go there and see, okay, well, what are you doing? What's special about this particular unit of the organization? And then what can we then do with that to, uh, to spread the good word and the good practices to others? Okay, so that's the first article about the pitfalls. The, the second article, this was the European article, talks about institutional responsibilities. They noted this interesting survey about how biomedical trainees are pushed to publish. And because they are pushed to publish, they may publish uh, unreliable results. This was a, a survey that was conducted at MD Anderson Cancer Center. They asked trainees whether or not they felt pressure to publish on certain findings. Almost 20% answered yes to that. Whether they felt pressure to support a mentor's hypothesis, even when the data did not support it, over 30% said yes to that. And that they knew of mentors who required lab members to have a high impact publication before moving on. Nearly half said yes to that. So they proposed something which they call GIP, or good institutional practice. They argue that in certain areas of research, like clinical research, well-defined good practices uh, are out there. And the same type of thing should exist for institutional practices that foster research integrity. They say, we propose that research institutions that receive public funding should apply the same kind of oversight and support to ensure research integrity as is routinely applied for animal husbandry, biosafety, and clinical work. The scientific community should come up with a similar system, which we term good institutional practice, or GIP. And then they go on to say that funding should depend on a certified record of good institutional practice. What is good institutional practice? So they identify six tenets. One is routine discussion of research methods. You can think of this as frequent meetings by which people get together and they discuss what's, uh, what their findings are, what they think they may mean, what they're doing right, what they might want to do differently. The second are reporting systems. So this might mean, for example, having a, a hotline, an anonymous hotline within an organization by which people can report concerns. Uh, I previously worked in an institution where we had a hotline and that hotline worked. There were times that we received um, anonymous complaints. We honestly did not know who we were getting these complaints from, but those anonymous complaints then led to sub substantial uh, discoveries and actions. The presence of uh, training uh, and standards for proper research practice, records and quality management. I'm going to spend a bit more time talking about what exactly that means.
appropriate incentive and evaluation systems and enforcement. Enforcement is, is critical. There has to be a, an environment of accountability. People should know that if they play fast and loose with the rules, that uh, there will be consequences. They go on to say that funding bodies should make good institutional practice a prerequisite for receiving funding. Now, I mentioned that one of the tenets of good institutional practice, the authors argue, is records and quality management. They say laboratory notebooks and records must be available for independent review. Electronic laboratory notebooks facilitate collaboration, supervision, and record keeping, and can link records to the original data. One of our institutions is now adopting these systems, are now adopting these system-wide. Random audits should be conducted. Uh, I am aware of a number of institutions around the United States that are implementing electronic laboratory notebooks. I know that this is not simple, that in some cases it involves uh, substantial transaction costs as well as changes in, in processes and procedures. Nonetheless, uh, a number of institutions feel that electronic laboratory notebooks may actually help improve research communication, but also uh, may provide disincentives for fabricating data and make it easier to uh, investigate problems uh, should they occur. Now, an important overarching theme of the tenants that I mentioned, let me just go back to these uh, tenants here, discussion of research methods, reporting systems, training and standards, records and quality management, and appropriate incentive and evaluation systems, all of these involve some kind of communication. It involves some way in which people within organizations talk to each other or share information with each other. And so I think that an important tenet, an overarching tenet of a climate of research integrity is one in which there are properly frameworked methods of communication and information sharing. That is absolutely critical. And so along that theme, I now want to move on to a somewhat different topic, uh, but one that is closely linked to this idea of communication. As many of you may know, late last year, uh, October of 2018, we posted this guide notice entitled Responsibilities of Recipient Institutions in Communicating Research Misconduct to the NIH. Much of this notice is an echo of the vocabulary that I already shared with you that's in the NIH grants policy statement. So in this uh, guide notice, we point out that we at NIH have a number of interests. One of our interests is to make sure that the terms and conditions of our awards are met. And uh, along those lines, that there is an ability to conduct and continue a project as it was originally approved. Now, there is regulatory language that states that, that under certain circumstances, NIH has a right to know and should be part of this communication. I'll read specifically from the regulatory language uh, in accordance with 93.318. Institutions must notify the Office of Research Integrity and other PHS agencies as relevant of any special circumstances that may exist. So let's say that an institution has concerns that uh, research misconduct may have occurred within their midst. They've done their initial inquiry. Based on their initial inquiry, they feel that there is enough to go on to uh, launch a formal investigation. So now they launch a formal investigation. Does the institution have a responsibility to notify the NIH? Well, these are the special circumstances that the uh, regulation pulls out. Th these are some, not, not all of them. Uh, health or safety of the public at risk as well, including an immediate need to protect human or animal subjects. HHS resources or interests are threatened. Notice I highlighted that. Research activities should be suspended. There may be possible violations of civil or criminal law or the research community or public should be informed. So in many cases, HH interests or resources may very well be threatened, and therefore it is important to bring NIH into the conversation. Now, echoing back to the grants policy statement, the grants policy statement says, recipients shall immediately notify the federal awarding agency of developments that have a significant impact on the award-supported activities. Notification shall be given in the case of problems, delays, or adverse conditions which materially impair the ability to meet the objectives. 
This notification shall include a statement of the action taken or contemplated and any assistance that may be needed from the agency. Now, we know that since we put this notice out, reminding institutions of their responsibility to communicate with us uh, when there are concerns and investigations regarding research misconduct, we know that uh, there are, have been concerns uh, raised. Uh, one of the most important is confidentiality. It is critically important to understand that just because there is an investigation does not necessarily mean that there is actual research misconduct. And it is critically important that we not ruin the reputation or career of an investigator just because of that. And so because of that, we have set up our communications in, in a very narrow, carefully guarded way. The communications that we're talking about in that guide notice are restricted to the uh, extramural research integrity officer, that's Dr. Patricia Valdez. We do not share information widely with other NIH staff when we get these notifications. Now, another important uh, aspect here is that we have a very strong working relationship with the Office of Research Integrity, with ORI. And in fact, I must say this has been one of the great pleasures of my working as NIH Deputy Director for Extramural Research. It's been the opportunity to work with ORI and build up upon an already strong relationship into one that, that's even stronger. Now, ORI has added language to their standard letters that they send to institutions, in which they remind institutions of the need to contact NIH under certain circumstances. And they remind them that there's a need for them to work with NIH on issues related to grant oversight and stewardship. We at NIH are not interested in conducting investigations, making uh, findings of research misconduct, or imposing penalties. Th that's not our function. But we do have a function, we have a very important function to assure proper oversight and stewardship of grants. And I have to say that uh, up until now, the experience since we put this guide notice out has been uh, positive. We have received uh, dozens uh, of notifications. Uh, some of them are quite detailed, uh, some of them uh, less so, but they have enabled us to work closely and collaboratively with institutions um, to make sure that our stewardship functions and institution stewardship functions uh, are being conducted in the most proper way possible given the circumstances that exist uh, at the time. The final item I want to talk about is whether or not there are other ways in which NIH policies could potentially shape the climate that affect uh, research integrity. Uh, one possibility would be to give out awards that assure uh, stability of funding that might decrease the, the need for scientists to feel tempted to cut corners. We have some of our institutes put out so-called R35 awards. These are awards that focus on funding programs of research, uh, programs of research within a laboratory as opposed to specific projects, and they allow for a, a period of stable funding. The National Cancer Institute has put out a R37 award for early stage investigators by which they are uh, able to assure themselves nearly seven years of funding, assuming adequate progress uh, along the way. Uh, a second uh, approach that NIH can take is to recognize non-traditional products, products other than papers that appear in published peer-reviewed journals. These would include, for example, uh, data sets, uh, resources, uh, as well as preprints. A third type of policy which is coming and which may have uh, an enormous impact on research integrity climate is data sharing. And if you think about it, data sharing itself is a kind of communication. It's a kind of uh, way in which we share information with each other. As some of you may know, the 21st Century Cures Act included a provision that uh, authorized the NIH director to require data sharing, potentially for all NIH grants. Uh, this is something that we are working on. Uh, late last year, we put out an RFI in which we asked people to give us feedback about some approaches that we might take. In that RFI, we state that NIH is, in NIH's view, data should be made as widely and freely available as possible while safeguarding the privacy of participants and protecting confidential and proprietary data. Increasing access to scientific data offers many benefits and reflects NIH's responsibility to maintain stewardship over taxpayer funds. 
One of the benefits of increasing access to scientific data is that it will create a way in which the scientific community can more quickly check on each other and rapidly identify integrity problems. You may remember at the beginning of the talk, I, I mentioned uh, the Anil Pati story. I talked about the MD Anderson mathematicians and statisticians who conducted what they call the forensic bioinformatics study. I now want to mention a, a more recent study that I think nicely illustrates how data sharing can have a profound effect. Some of you may remember that in late 2014, there was a paper published by LaCour and Green in Science. Uh, it argued that people's attitudes towards same-sex marriage might change over a relatively short period of time if uh, given the opportunity to, uh, to hear maybe 15 to 20 minutes of conversation. The paper was claimed and generated a huge amount of discussion. There were other investigators who uh, wanted to wanted to leverage uh, those results and, and even uh, replicate those results. Three of them are shown here, uh, Brookman, Kala, and Aronow. What they did was they took the data that were made available, that had to be made available at the time, and uh, they found a whole series of irregularities. Now, the paper, the original paper was published in December of 2014. The finding of the multiple irregularities was published, uh, or was posted, I should say, on May 19, 2015, only six months uh, later. And within a few days after that, the uh, paper was retracted. This is a very different kind of story than what happened with John Darcy, where it took years before his fabricated results uh, were discovered, or Neil Potty, where it also took uh, years. Here, because of the fact that data sharing was available, it was possible to discover the problem within a very short period of time and take steps to rectify it. Now, a key stakeholder that we haven't talked about would be journals. And you may remember one of the headlines I showed you earlier on was the New England Journal pulling some papers. JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, put out this uh, recent editorial, Scientific Misconduct in Medical Journals. Of course, in many ways, the way scientific misconduct manifests itself is through journal articles that contain falsified, fabricated, or, or plagiarized information. The uh, authors uh, of this paper, Howard Bauschner, who's the uh, editor-in-chief there, and his colleagues, Phil Fontana Rosen and Annette Flanagan, they say involving institutions is done with great care for several reasons. First, even just an allegation of misconduct can harm the reputation of an individual. Then they go on to say that institutions are responsible for ensuring appropriate due process and confidentiality. And then just as JAMA receives allegations of scientific misconduct and research irregularities, so do institutions. I think one of the key themes here is, again, this sense, this importance of communication, of sharing information with each other, but doing it in a careful and properly frameworked way. So in closing, research integrity is a topic in which we have seen a changing vocabulary. Whereas back in the 1980s, we heard stories of individual researchers who engaged in shocking behavior. Now the conversation is shifting to not only the misbehavior of individual researchers, but also the responsibilities of the entire enterprise. The entire enterprise, including institutions where researchers work, funding agencies that provide the money that enables uh, science to happen, and journals who publicize the uh, results of the research. I uh, talked to you about the important fact that NIH issues awards to institutions uh, and not to individuals, that our vocabulary is very much focused on institutional roles, responsibilities, and rights, as opposed to those of individual uh, scientists. I discussed uh, some institutional approaches that are being discussed, including the use of, a, of database assessments of integrity culture and then using that information to target education and interventions, and about the importance of implementing uh, appropriate communications incentives uh, and enforcement. Uh, and, and then finally, I ended by talking uh, briefly about some NIH approaches that might help shape a better climate for research integrity including our focus on stewardship and communications, as well as policies that may help mold the culture, in particular data sharing. 
I want to thank you very much for joining me today. I hope that you found these thoughts uh, interesting, and I encourage you to learn more about steps that we can all take to enhance a climate of research integrity throughout our entire enterprise, and in that way make our enterprise more effective in finding the cures for tomorrow. Let me just uh, mention here that there are a number of uh, resources that we have um, available. Please take a look at our Research Integrity homepage uh, where you can find information about research integrity definitions, policies, uh, how we handle misconduct, information about how our own intramural program handles uh, responsible conduct of research as well as uh, intramural resources. And I want to give particular thanks to my many colleagues in the uh, office of the director, in particular Patricia Valdez, Sally Amaro, and Valerie Bonham, but many others who play a critical role in helping us to do what we can to ensure the best research integrity we can have. Thank you.